Welcome to RPV City Talk. RPV City Talk is brought to you by the City of Rancho Palos Verdes to inform the community on recent city matters. RPV City Talk is a weekly show that features the RPV Mayor, City Council, or City Employees. Hi everyone, I'm Liz Brown Swanson and welcome to RPV City Talk. It's always great to have the Mayor of Rancho Palos Verdes here, Mayor Jerry Dehovic. Um, you always come in to give us a great update on all the issues and matters before the council. And I have to say, we haven't been in here since June, so we have lots to talk about. Um, lots going on this entire summer. Hope you're having a nice summer. Big agenda, yeah. Thank you, Liz. And uh, having a great summer so far, and I know the city is too. Um, you know, weather's been perfect, and we have some things that uh, we're going to talk about that uh, that were a little bit troubling, but by and large, it's been a great summer in RPV so far. So I did want to, before we start, I did want to say a couple things. Uh, I did just want to, you know, personally give my condolences to you and your husband on the loss of your father-in-law. I know that was recent, and uh, that's never that. easy, but uh, anyway. Uh, Bittersweet journey, but a wonderful man, and uh, we'll miss him, but uh, he's definitely at peace, so thank you for that. Well, that's, that's the least we can do. And number two, I also want to congratulate you and Mark and Maria on the... Uh, recent uh, Tele Award for Outstanding Cable Programming, and I know it had to do with the uh, International Bird Rescue and, and the story associated with that. So on behalf of me personally and the well, council and the city, congratulations to all of you, Mark and Maria, are you well, out there too? Thank you, we <laughs> always appreciate the opportunity to have the studio here, thanks to the council and all your support, and uh, we hopefully try to cover stories in the community that matter and mean something, and of course that inter International Bird Rescue in San Pedro is phenomenal, the work they do. I mean, birds come in from all over the state. You said you had your own personal experience because the bird rescue um, operation is a nonprofit, but they're typically not open to the public, which I think the program he did, you know, allowed the community to see what they do, the great work they do. Absolutely. But you said you went in there. Had with a personal your... experience. Yeah, we had a, a pelican uh, crash into the backyard during a party, and it took us about three or four hours to figure out who to go to. But we worked with the uh, bird rescue, and they, they actually, it was on a weekend, and one of the uh, uh, proprietors, I think it was the same woman that you talked about, actually came out and instructed us how to move the bird and help the bird. So they, they do great work. They, mm -hmm. you know, we need that service. Right. So. And uh, in fact, right now that program we won the award for, it's an Around the Peninsula program, is running on our channel. So look for that. We hope that our, our community will enjoy watching that. And I'm and looking forward to seeing it again. Organization. <laughs> um, all right. Well, we were talking about summertime is here. And with it, sadly, we've had some tragedy. Um, and unfortunately, we had um, over the 4th of July week, we had a situation with a drowning of a Long Beach man um, mm -hmm. off Sacred Cove. And, of course, I think there was 50 rescues or more by lifeguards along our coast because people are just, they're not being safe, sadly. And um, yeah. it's beautiful coast, but it can be dangerous. Well, let me give you a couple statistics. Isn't it? I have them entrenched in my mind. First of all, it was actually the first two weeks of July from about the 1st through the 14th. And, and the uh, July 4th weekend, we did have... Um, 50 plus rescues, probably approaching 60, three that were major that required airlifts and there was one young man airlifted to the hospital who on a good note was originally reported as having perished as a result of his injuries. Uh, and it took us a very long time to just very recently figure out that he spent well over a week in the hospital, uh, but ultimately he survived and he's recovering. and. Uh, uh, so we've got some good news out of that. So what we have now is one confirmed death, not two, uh, which was the information. So, you know, our, our best goes out to him and his family. Also, our condolences go out to the young man from Long Beach that you were talking about. Uh, uh, that was a very, very tragic situation. He, you know, for the record, was in fact warned by one of the rangers about 20 minutes before going in there that the, the surge is high and the riptides are strong and not to go in there. and. Um, unfortunately, he chose to go in anyway, along with his friends. Um, and the, the sad part about it, too, is you know when, when he actually went missing, it took four days for him finally to his, his body to be recovered. And it was the family who sighted him in the water. They, they held a vigil there every day. I spent quite a bit of time with the family, both on site and uh, in, in their neighborhood at, at a mass of support and, and all these different things. But it's uh, uh, many, many rescues there. You know, the, I think the city stepped forward and, and handled it appropriately, worked very closely with the lifeguards and the sheriff department to come up with a plan, uh, especially during the rescue efforts there. And, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention them again. The mountain rangers, uh, the lifeguards, the fire department, 
uh, and especially the divers. And, and if, for those of you who've driven by and, and you see divers on top, I asked the question, I said, why are those divers on top? And I didn't realize those are rescue divers. There's actually di a diver right below that individual, okay. one on top in case the one below gets into trouble. So this was very, very treacherous. I talked to one of the divers and he told me that that was in his 23 years of diving, that was the most treacherous recovery exercise that he's ever been involved with. So we have seven and a half miles of coastline. Uh, you know, some people talk about closing it down. For the record, the city can't close it down. It's a, it's a public property. Uh, and, we're, and just we're talking for residents yeah. that along our coast, you know, we think of Abalone Cove where you can park and go down, where this diver, the one that lost his life, um, he was in what's called Sacred Cove, which is the cove over, correct? So there's, there's He was like, actually on the point. You have Inspiration Point, Sacred Cove, and Portuguese Point. He was actually in Inspiration Point right. in one of the caves and got sucked back into the which, cave. Of course, for anyone going in there, there's no lifeguard. There's no visible lifeguard down there, yeah. like you say. If, if, P, if you're internet inclined, just, just Google Abalone Cove Dangerous, and you can really see in a moment's notice how the, the surge and the current changes is very, very shocking. There was a young gal in there who they filmed that got tossed around for a couple minutes, and just that, that puts it all into perspective. Yeah. So, but, but our condolences does go, do go out to that family. Uh, again, uh, staff and, and, uh, and all the first responders did an outstanding job. We are still, there is a task force that has been in place. We're going to look at what else we can do for additional signage. And actually, the only entity that can, in fact, shut down one of the beaches temporarily is the lifeguards. Um, and we are looking to see if there are times where it's appropriate to do that. But understand, we have, again, seven and a half miles of coastline. And... Uh, you know, some would argue, too, that you should only swim where there's a lifeguard. Well, we can't put a lifeguard during the entire expanse of the seven and a half miles. But we are looking to do what we can. We take this very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, loss of life, especially a young life, makes it uh, that much more poignant. And we are focused on it. So we'll be getting regular updates and on I'm this. Just reminding um, <coughs> residents about safety. You know, obviously, you know, swim with somebody, for one. You know, not swim alone. That's things right. Things like that. Just some common, the common sense things, you know. And, if, again, if you have a ranger or an official come up to you and say, do not go in the water. You need to heed that advice. Absolutely. That's, that's the biggest thing because there's a talk about an education effort. Well, I don't think there's much more we could have done in that particular case, unfortunately. Right. You know. Well, you know, we will just, uh, just keep the effort and, and letting people know and um, to be safe out there. And that task force, the Abalone Cove um, Safety Task Force. That's right. Tremendous work and that team effort of everybody. And there is, there, I think the biggest thing, too, on signage is, is getting, you know, versus just putting no lifeguard on duty, really putting some strong language that, you know, swim, swimming here may, uh, may result in significant injury and or death. And, and actually there was talk about somehow monitoring, especially those two particular areas and actually having someone going down and putting a red sign and having the lifeguard officially shut it down in known times of, of uh, um, when, the, when, the, when the water conditions. Yeah, when, there's, when it's more that. hazardous than normal. It's always hazardous, but it's, you know, sometimes it's even right. more hazardous I mean, even and treacherous. You said you used to go down there as a kid. We did. I know my boys have gone down there. And, Absolutely. And, 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 and I think I heard uh, the Mayor Pro Tem reference too. Like you, now with social media, mm -hmm. you know everybody is being driven there. They all want to come see it. It's a beautiful spot, but if people don't know the the water. And when all this it, went down, I went and looked at it, and they, you know, they're putting music to it, and it looks great, and it looks very, you know, they're diving and jumping off the cliffs. But it is very, very treacherous. I, you know, right. in hindsight, again, just. By the grace of God, you know, none of, I didn't or none of my friends got hurt, but, you know. Well, that's there's a reason why there's, don't fool with Mother Nature. That's I mean, true, really too. You really to really respect the ocean, and um, so we appreciate that everybody that's on it, from law enforcement officials, and other sheriffs were involved, and, and yeah. um, in uh, fact, we're going to go down, RPV TV is going to go down there and, and meet with some of those members of the task force to uh, kind of, to walk us around Abalone Cove in these points to show the community, like, you know, this may look like it's it's calm, but it's really not. That's right. It's, and it changes at a moment's very notice. very deceiving. It is. And, and, um, and we're talking about some things about trying to get people to go to, to the right places with respect to parking and, and trail access and things along those lines. So that's all being looked at, too, which is very important. Okay. All right. Well, um, keep us posted on what's going on there. And... Um, that's going to move me on since we're talking about safety and mm -hmm. law enforcement. How about what's been going on with the sheriff's department? They made an announcement recently where they had a, um, a, a, a an identification theft ring was busted. That's right. great news. That is great news. There were three people apprehended, and uh, two of them were local. Um, Torrance, San Pedro, and uh, I think the third one was from San Pedro also. But um, 
there were residents of RPV that were also affected by this and, you know, stealing credit cards and identities and mail and all this stuff. And apparently this ring was responsible for quite a bit of that on the peninsula. So congratulations to the sheriffs. Again, thank mm -hmm. you for, for your diligence there. And they're, they're doing a stand-up job. And uh, um, again, we just need to be vigilant as, as residents and take care of your neighbors, you know, right. keep, keep your our, eyes peeled. And keep our community as the claim to fame in Rancho Palos Verdes. We are one of the safest places to be in L.A. County. We want to stay that way. That is true. So. All right, you. We have. We are basically going to talk about things that you've been taking up at the like about five or six. It feels like five meetings you've had since June. Um, big thing happening right now. City <coughs> manager search, of course, top priority for the council. What's going on there? Sure. Well, we've um, we've had two town hall meetings. We've also had a public outreach online uh, with a survey and also a hard copy survey if residents were inclined to. Um, to give us their feedback and I attended both town hall meetings and there was a very good dialogue there. Bob Murray, our consultant, was there uh, and took in the, the resident input and incorporated that into the uh, job uh, bulletin, the city manager uh, bulletin. Um, my understanding there was right around a hundred surveys brought into so all that along with interviews of council and staff and uh, I sent a personal letter to our committees and the planning commission for their input to try and get to uh, Mr. Murray so we can really, uh, so he could assimilate what we want collectively as a community and a city manager. So that process has been done. Uh, we had a council meeting last night, an mm -hmm. extra council meeting, right. um, where we talked about the language for the uh, city manager recruitment bulletin and we gave some edits there. and. That'll be uh, finalized and approved at the next meeting, and then we go out and hopefully uh, get a whole host of candidates. I would think to that this would be a very attractive city to work for. I mean, coastal city, beautiful, well paid. Who <laughs> wouldn't Who wouldn't want to work in uh, RPV and right. run the show here? But right. uh, there's a lot. Hopefully, we'll get a lot of talented people. Right. For you as a mayor, is there, I mean, is there anything right now, like for you, that's really important with the next city manager, you know, your personal thoughts? Yeah, I think that um, the, the individual needs to have experience um, either, you know, in the municipal sector and or comparable private sector experience, but definitely has to have a knowledge of the municipal environment. Um, the, the experience in a coastal city would be terrific. Uh, has to be a team builder, has to be a leader, has to be able to work with different personalities on council and internally. Um, somebody brought up the word innovative last night and creative. I think we need that. And I also think that the, the individual needs to understand the, the uh, community we have. We have a very educated and involved community. As a matter of fact, there was a survey, which I don't have in front of me, that uh, RPV was designated in the state of California like in the top five as far as an educated citizenry. So uh, along with some of those that are the most and, and well insured on a health side. So there was a couple different categories where RPV excelled, but one of them was in education. And so we have a very educated uh, uh, citizenry and, and an involved citizenry. And uh, this, this city manager needs to understand that, that there's going to be input, there's going to be uh, a lot of eyes watching and a lot of involvement, and they need to welcome that and embrace that versus uh, potentially uh, doing the opposite. So. Mm -hmm. So in the in the perfect world, what would be the timeline you see? Maybe we actually will have a new city manager on board. Well, we're or talking we're talking about ideally having the whole thing completed by November. Um, the once this is approved next week, we're going to open it up for recruitment, and I think the cutoff is September fifteenth. So for all the applicants, and then uh, Mr. Murray will do his deal and and vet and do the pre-interviews, and hopefully come back to us with six, seven, or eight. Uh, candidates to glean down even further and start that interview it's process. A very exciting charge for the council. I think. Did you say in the last 20 years we've had two? That's right. So. So it's it's uh, it's exciting. It's important. This is the leader of the of the uh, city from uh, you know municipal corporate organizations, municipal municipal corporation, mm -hmm. and uh, they set the tone, the tenor, and and the uh, not only of staff but the city at large too. All right. So. Well, thanks for the update. Yeah. Also at last night's meeting, big, big um, uh, accomplishment for the council. You were able to select a um, consultant that will 
perform the classification and compensation study of what we have is in the city 84 employees is that's that right? right yeah it's so uh, that's 50 54 full-time and about 30 part-timers so uh, when was the decision made bring us back for a minute to actually do this study I, I, I can't remember. this was probably two months ago and this had to do with our negotiations with the uh, new employee union um, the rank and file union mm -hmm. the non-exempt employee union um, you know, we there was a initial to and fro with respect to the the first salvos in a negotiation for for a collective bargaining agreement or MOU, memorandum of understanding. But it's really the contract with the employees, and we've been working on that for a while now. And uh, the council collectively thought it appropriate in order for us to make intelligent decisions and to be fair and and. Uh, um, you know, not just uh, all over the place or that we needed some direction. And the city hadn't done a classification study, which is basically looking at the jobs, see how they compare to how other cities do things. Should we reclassify? Should we combine certain of the, of the job functions? And then take a look at it comparatively to other cities and what the benchmarks are. Uh, and then the second step of that is once you, once you define what those roles are in the city, and every city's different, you know, people assign different duties to, to various employees as, a, as in any company. Um, but then to come back and for that particular job at, in this case, we're going to go out to 12, what they call comparator cities, and say, well, what are they getting paid? And let's bring that back and compare it to where we are. Are we too high? Are we right in the middle? Are we too low? Um, we need that information, again, to make intelligent decisions because obviously compensation uh, is probably one of the biggest things we talk about, not only work conditions and benefits, but, you know, people getting paid is a, a, of a big concern to them, and we want to make sure we do it right and do it fair. And we hadn't done a, a classification study for about 20 years. Uh, we did a third-party comp study about 10 years ago, and we've done a couple internally, and I think the latest one was a handful of years ago, two or three years ago. So it's about time we did it. Um, it's a good practice to do it. We needed to do it. Um, and that's It'll be a helpful tool to have that. Absolutely. And, and uh, Cause and Associates, the, the vendor we picked, I was on the subcommittee uh, along with Councilwoman Brooks, and we've, we've picked an excellent uh, vendor, and they are going to provide yeah. us with very important data. So. I was there when you were interviewing the, the, the final two candidates, which were both great choices, and I have to say they were very impressive. And, and to know that, I think one thing that they referenced that in all the years and 30 years of them doing this, you know, they don't have appeals by the employees that they're all this different stakeholders. They have to like look at the whole big picture, right? So exactly. They had a very impressive record, and they've even worked here in the community. Um, they just recently did this for Palos Verdes Library District, so they they seem to really know the community. They do, and and uh, it's important that one of the things that struck me is they're very collaborative in their in their approach, and it includes everybody from you know the city council, department heads, mid managers, the employees, and the union, and all this is going to be brought together and keep everybody abreast of what's going on through this process. And the council so. felt satisfied with the level of input. You'll be able, the way they will work with you collaboratively. I mean, that's very important. Yeah, we, we you know, as far as on, on the classification side, the people that really know are, are the city manager, the department heads, and the employees themselves, and they're going to work very closely with mm -hmm. the, with the uh, vendor um, to, to bring that forward and, and work through that. There's a lot of work, there's a lot of interviews, a lot of yeah. paperwork, a lot of comparing. And they'll work through that, and they'll bring it to council and keep us abreast of what's going on. But we'll be more, much more involved in picking the comparator cities and the benchmarks and, and, and make sure we have concurrence that we're being compared, our PV is being compared to... Is there a city right now off the top of your head you think we must be compared to them? I don't well, know. there are yes. several in South Orange County that, that jump, come to mind. You know, Dana Point, uh, you know, maybe Laguna Beach, maybe, you know, I'm not sure, you know, just... There are some geographically situated uh, near us, and you know they may or may not be appropriate. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. Palos Verdes Estates, but maybe Manhattan Beach, some of these other cities. You know. you know, and of course that firm has done a bunch of the beach cities, or, not, or cities, you know. Oceanside City. So, yeah. so that was, I think, it said they had about a timeline of four months. So four months, and then you know we have other things we need to talk about. There's a guideline right now that the city wants to be in the 75th percentile of compensation, at least 75th percentile of compensation for our employees, and that's a good thing, but we also, it was brought up last night that there might be better benchmarking, so right. those types of decisions yeah, will Yeah, I thought when she brought it, it was interesting that you just sort of say, you know, we're 10% above that. Above thought, the median. Yeah, yeah. It was, yeah. A lot of good things to talk yeah, about so there, that's, so. That's, that's good. So that's, that's a, that was a big deal to have that, and then of course that will help move forward with everything going on with the union. And exactly, and, and we're, we're very excited about Again, doing it correctly, doing it well, uh, doing it fairly, and moving forward. Okay. So. 
Well, we've been spending some time talking about things happening with employees from city manager search to, you know, uh, doing the study of our employees. And now there was discussion of maybe bringing on a new employee to the city, which would have been a council liaison. And as the, I don't know how much the community is, but all of you are pretty much volunteers and you have full time jobs and you work a lot. So I think well, it that came much up. is true. <laughs> I think it came up. I mean, you were like probably, you know, work 50 hours a week trying to do all the things you're doing for the city. And so, you know, the, it came up that you need some assistance and the thought of a council liaison, but you've kind of decided to put that aside for now. We right? did. Yeah, there was there was a, a lot of discussion and it went from, you know, we don't have we have our staff in the city, but they each have their own jobs and the city manager and the rest of the staff are always very supportive, at least in my experience of, of council members uh, when we ask questions and we route everything through the city manager. But there was talk that there, there are situations where we get a lot of communication from residents that, that may ask questions and, and um, you know, a liaison or a staff person may be able to assist us in fielding a lot of those. I can tell you as mayor, I get a lot of them. And uh, I do deal a lot with the city manager and that's a, you know, a very high-end employee that spends a lot of time talking to me about that stuff and that we, we, we're, the thought is we may be able to bring that to a, a a full-time employee to assist council members on special projects and also support council in dealing with the community. And there's, it's in the staff report, a bunch of different things. But what we also talked about too is maybe setting up a, uh, a concierge type person or a help desk or a one call solves all type person at City Hall, which we used to have and things change over time. Mm -hmm. um, just to, just to, to, to better serve the public and uh, give direction to people who have questions and, and hopefully someone that would be able to assist people without necessarily ratcheting it up to the top level person in the city. So what the council said last night is we're, we're on the cusp of hiring a new city manager. These are all great ideas and my colleagues had a lot of good ideas on this topic and there was more discussion but I think we made the appropriate decision in, in saying why don't we wait for the new city manager and get some input from that person right, see and what see where we go. The needs will be there. Exactly. Okay. So we'll look forward to hearing more about that down the road. Right. All right. Um, your one big action you all took was to <coughs> approve the 2014-15 budget. We did. Absolutely. Talking money. Well, again, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, money's always important. Uh, that's part of probably one of our biggest responsibilities is approving a budget and being good financial stewards of the city's uh, assets and resources. And, and uh, um, you know, again, Priority number one is public safety. One A is infrastructure, and both of those cost money, and and along with a whole host of other things. But um, the city again is is in good financial shape. We have a balanced budget. Our city uh, financial staff did a great job of presenting the various types of reports, uh, including you know the five year model and the infrastructure. Uh, um, you know the capital improvements plan and the budget and all the sub documents and all that. But uh, and what is our budget? Uh, well, it depends how you look at it. We have, you know, the, the actual um, budget right now is $34 million, um, and we actually have about $36 million in spending, but we had $2 million set aside accumulated for uh, infrastructure projects. But our general fund revenue is about $24 million, somewhere around there. But, you know, there's, there's monies that move in different accounts that move from year to year. So our reserves, our general fund reserve and our CIP reserve are well funded and we are again the, the beneficiaries of a robust TOT uh, from tax from Terranea. So we're very thankful. Yeah. Thank you, Terranea. <laughs> I know, I know. And by the way, we always have to, especially this year, five year anniversary. That's and right. All they've been able to accomplish. Well, congratulations to them again and their yeah. management team. They are, you know, that is a major, major boost for the city and uh, we don't take that lightly. So, okay. Yeah. yeah, I think, what is it, over $10 million that they've generated? At least. Since they've opened their doors or yeah. more? Yeah, probably Huge. right around there. Yeah. And that's just from their rooms tax. It's not any all the other. I think it might be a little bit more than that, but yeah. you, you might be right. Yeah. Big numbers. Yep. Okay. So um, one of your recent meetings, uh, I don't remember which one it was, but uh, one of the issues that came up, the council had to consider had to do with Sunnyside Ridge Trail Improvement Project. Mm -hmm. So we get to talk horses now. Sounds like a Western, doesn't it? Sunnyside yeah. Ridge. Sunnyside yeah. Ridge. Um, and so explain <coughs> to the residents what became before the council. I know that there, the, basically there's the concept of improving this trail um, that's off PB Drive East, right? That's it's right. It's, it's, it's a trail segment that's, uh, that's actually a trail right now. Um, it's part of the uh, equestrian overlay um, that we have in the city. And according to the city's conceptual trails plan, Sunnyside Ridge, uh, is a segment of the Palos Verdes Loop Trail. And it's unimproved right now. It's been around for a while, and, and the 
what happened was, is over the course of time and the ability for a, an individual to build a house, the trail basically goes right between two houses. And, um, you know, the residents came forward. It's interesting in this particular case, we have a grant. The, 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 actually, the city council approved on May 20th, I believe was the date, May 20th, uh, accepting the grant of $300,000 and, and uh, allocating another 165 to complete the projects, a $465,000 project. There's a bridge and remediation and all these different things and mitigation efforts. But in this particular case, I guess there was some confusion with most of the residents uh, that they didn't understand the, the uh, process where they can come give commentary to the council in public speaking. Uh, so in, in, in an abundance of caution and being as fair as we could be, we re-agendized it on July 15th and listened to the residents. And they, they brought some significant concerns, significant concerns including safety and privacy and different cars parking and this becoming a, a, a focal point or a destination trail and all these different things and all very legitimate concerns. So. What the council did, um, and I think was very prudent, was basically said, okay, listen, it's a, it's a current trail. There's a safety issue. We understand everything you're talking about. Design was the key here, especially for the, the two homes most affected, which are the ones that the trail goes right in between. And it's not a big space. It's, you know, 15 feet, 20 but feet. But of course, any homeowner in there, when they purchase, know you're in an equestrian they do. area too. But they do, and there is, a, there is a recognized and properly recorded easement there. Um, but we still heard out the homeowners and what we want to do, be very, very sensitive to that, uh, mm -hmm. especially if it is going to increase uh, equestrian traffic because, you know, when you're sitting on a horse, you're up a lot higher and you're going by people's windows and their kitchens. We want to make sure, we want to be very sensitive to that. So what we decided was uh, that we would use the city allocated monies to uh, and directed staff to go back and go through the design process, work with the community, come back to us, and, and let's see if we can get something that's palatable uh, without putting the, the grant money in jeopardy and with also without spending it and if we decided to nix the project that we'd have to go back and give it back. So right. I think it was a good decision on the part of uh, the council. So that's slated to come back? It's slated to come back. Staff is working on it. Um, right now as we speak we, we, we understand that there's some timing with respect to the uh, the grant funds so they're they're working diligently on it. Okay. And we should hopefully come back with a, a design in the not too distant right. future. Well so. for me since I don't live on that part and I don't have a Course, I found it very interesting and educational to walk, look at that loop and how it actually connects to the whole big loop system, which again, unless you ride horses, you don't realize it's well, there, but it's pretty... Uh, you got to understand too is that, you know, the, the uh, conceptual trails plan and the Palos Verde, there's about eight or nine different trail plans if you take all these different names and, and actually the city's working to consolidate it into one trail plan, which which I suggested a long time ago and I think is going to be great because there is, it's, it's confusing even for people on council to understand <laughs> all the nuance on there, but... It, I think you know, if had someone show up that said, okay, you're going to come to our neighborhood next for the trail next door. That's right. Like, there's, okay. there's the lube trail, the spoke trail, the, you know, all these different trail plans. And, and the bottom line is we need to get a handle on it. The idea is, and it's a, you know, the, the coastal trail, there's all these different things, but we, we want the trails that's part of our, our history, that's part of our connectivity. It's a safety issue also from an ingress and egress standpoint. People don't realize that it's a very, very big piece of the puzzle. Um, but these things take time and it happens and, and the city manager pointed it out right. that you know segment by segment by segment but if one segment you know you have this whole thing going around the the peninsula is 26 miles around if you go to 25 and a half miles but you can't get that last half mile of connectivity you know that's going to be an issue so um, we'll see what happens i think that uh you know this this trail was approved it was designed for connectivity i support the connectivity but again i'm sensitive to the residents and we want to do the best we can to mitigate whatever intrusions or concerns they might have okay well yeah. All right, so now we're going to move on to a special meeting you had on June 19th with the Emergency Preparedness Committee. It was a joint meeting with the council. How did that go? Uh, it went very well, and I'd also like to uh, thank and acknowledge uh, Chair Tim Weiner of the uh, Emergency Preparedness Committee for asking uh, for this meeting. They've done an excellent job. They, you know, I would encourage residents to go to the website. They're, they're mirroring uh, several cities across the country that have taken the lead as far as presentation and resources and it's they, they've just revamped the website and it's it's outstanding and tracy bonanno uh, on staff from uh, um, does a great job on the the emergency preparedness side but chair weiner had asked that a presentation be made in a joint meeting to talk about water in the case of a catastrophic emergency and and it's very very important uh, was very very educational we had mr henry wind of Cal Water came in and 
you know, he came in with this, this whole PowerPoint presentation, but uh, his presentation went on the fritz, so he did it off the top of his head, and he did an outstanding job. He talked for about two hours and, and had all the data and all the answers, but uh, uh, they have contingency plans in place. We learned how water is bought and purchased and allocated and, you know, the reservoirs on the hill and how the, how the water is fed by gravity and pumps and what have you and all that. But the bottom line is, in, in case of an emergency, they're going to work as diligently as they can to provide water, but residents need to prepare themselves. And the guideline is three days. He said that's kind of a, a standard guideline. It should be 10 days per person for personal water use. And that's not for showering or washing your clothes. That's for your own personal mm -hmm. consumption. And there was a lot of things that you, know, that, you, that you learned. For example, you think of pool water. Well, pool water will actually dehydrate you and make you sick. So that, that's not a resource. But you know, the interesting things is you have 50 or 90 gallons, depending on the size of your water heater, of usable water. And there was a whole host of uh, suggestions about how you can maintain water and use water and prepare yourself for this. But, you know, we, we're, we're in, you know, all you got to do is look at some of the catastrophes around the country and, mm -hmm. and uh, you, people need to be prepared. And the, the, the standing guideline is, is get water prepare for three to ten days for each individual person on what you think your consumption and usage is and and be prepared to be on your own for a while because it you know if it's catastrophic there's this is the LA basins a huge area and we have you know earthquakes fires floods tsunamis uh, you know, God only knows all the different things that may happen so you got to be prepared right but this they're saying definitely this hill would be cut off for three days Especially just because of our geography and you're going and uphill. There's a, you know, again, we can go scenario after scenario, but uh, um, we, we have a little bit different and a very unique geography when it comes to water and, and, and it creates challenges. I'm not going to ask you how much water is in your garage because you're my neighbor and I don't really have much in mind. But it's I have not, a lot of water in my garage. I we do. Need to, uh, I need to get on yeah, that. No, that's, we all say we're going to do that. And they deliver later. and I've done that quite a bit. So yeah, no, it's important I'll share to be with prepared. You. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so anything for else from that meeting that was discussed? And I know that... You, you know, know, we got an explicit detail, and it was they showed it on RPV right. TV, and it's, it's on the website, and it's, it's very interesting to hear, you know, just that you don't realize how many entities are involved in bringing water to Southern California, mm -hmm. you know, the Municipal Water District and West Basin as a right. wholesaler in between and Cal Water and this and that. You know, there's, it's, it's very, very interesting. But the bottom line is, again, you got to be prepared and prepare yourself. And in the meantime, keep conserving because we're in, you know, drought conditions. So this is another reminder to we're, our residents. We're in a major drought and uh, any and all efforts uh, with respect to conservation w would go a long way. We have to do that. Okay. Next item uh, that the council took action on had, <coughs> took action on had to do with uh, the storm drain user fee that we have here in the city, which I, I guess, understand is going to sunset in two years. Right, well. exactly. Just about two years, uh, June of uh, 2016, and uh, the one of the charges of the water oversight board is to come back with recommendations. They're they're in, passed by the residents way back when was the ability to increase that fee annually. I think the cap is 2%, and we looked at all that and analyzed that, and the council felt, based on the recommendations of the, uh, of the committee and the committee's chair and the, and the public in general, and understanding uh, how much has yet to be done on our storm drains and the unfunded projects, and it was a nominal increase, but we, we did approve and follow along with their recommendation. I believe the FAC also endorsed that recommendation. Um, so. Uh, we're going to have to address the, the actual storm drain user fee in the not-too-distant future because you know, two years may sound like a long time, but we, we have to decide how we're going to fund these infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And storm drains are a big part of it. Our, our infrastructure is dated and antiquated in certain areas. <clears throat> and we have to decide as a council how we're going to fund that. And we may have to bring this forward to the, to the public for a vote. Um, so we're, we're actually working. I think that's going to be brought back on another agenda to see what are our what are the steps in order to move this forward and consider what we're going to do. All right. I think the city manager mentioned, too, the slight increases that have taken place since it first started over time have contributed, you know, I think it was like a half a million dollars or something like that. So they're definitely, it helps. It does. And, and again, we have known, I think the number is just under $10 million right now of unfunded storm drain repairs that are necessary. And there's still, I think, 20 or 15 to 20 percent of the storm drain system that has yet to be fully um, uh, investigated and charted because there's repairs that need to go along along the way. If you're in a storm drain and it's full of roots or broken, you don't just mm -hmm. go in there and take a picture. You have to go in there and fix as you go. 
and then decide what needs to be remediated. So, okay. Lots of money in storm drains. Since we're talking lots of money, I'm going to segue <laughs> into the biggest infrastructure project for this city's history, which is San Ramon. That's right. $20 million project that is just about done. Yeah, it's, it's about done. Actually, San Ramon's ready to take water. I drive by it every day, a couple times a day, and it's, uh, it's pretty much completed. What we've done now, it's actually, I think the number is somewhere in the $18 million range. Okay. It was slated up to 20 um, and uh, outside of some of the uh, original value-added changes early on in the project, the project actually came in under budget, and uh, we are using some of the savings, and we're, we're actually the beneficiaries of being able to uh, use some of the grant funding we got from the state to assist us in doing some, some uh, uh, catch basin work on the switchbacks, which is all kind of part of San Ramon. No, part of the whole San Ramon project was to ensure and protect the integrity of the switchbacks. Um, but we're fixing some of the drainage facilities there, and we're actually, it's about an $800,000 project, so we're, we're, we're due to the, the hard work of our staff and of uh, L.H. Woods, uh, who that was the contractor, we're able to get another uh, significant project completed, and that should be done in you know, a couple months here. We always like to hear under budget. Under budget. And almost on time, right? Because I think you were thinking by the summer. So well, right? yeah, you know, and, they, and we're, we weren't pushing them on that because they were doing all this little extra work in the engineering for the, the, mm -hmm. the catch basins and all that. So they're, they're basically done. We talked about uh, April, May, June, and the, the bottom line is we, we didn't have a big grand opening, if you will, but it's ready to go, and they've re- uh, uh, you know, revegetated and doing everything, but it's 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 a great project so far. Well, if we have heavy rains in the winter, I as we both live Which up we heavy hope, drive yeah. south, I'll be thankful not to have that road blocked yeah, off. Yeah, pray for rain. Time. We could use the rain and let's see how it all works. Let's put that storm drain to good work. Excellent, excellent. Good use. And of course, like you said, San Ramon is right there next to the switchbacks, PV Drive yeah. East, and uh, keeping the integrity there. God forbid ever that were to we lose that, that would be huge. But you're working on PV Drive East right now, the city is with them. Um, big, big things, big things going on. The, the work started in earnest right after the end of the school year. And, and again, I think we've discussed this before, there's, there's uh, storm drain components, road realignments, um, uh, right of way and, and uh, widening and some, some tree trimming and removal and bike lanes to and from and ultimately resurfacing. It's, it's a couple million dollar, I think about a two and a half million dollar project. Um, we're, we're, we're working on it aggressively. You know, some residents may have experienced some time. I've did, I have myself, um, you know, be prepared for a flag man to stop you and traffic going back and forth because they work during the day. So mm -hmm. that, that's going to go on for the next several months. But we're targeting uh, that project being completed hopefully by mid to late September. Um, you know, right around the beginning of the school year. Right. So. And, it, and it's literally from PV Drive South, PV Drive East to, where does it stop? Uh, just shy of the border of uh, Rolling Hills Estates. So that's where it's going right down. To it's that, going right? all the way down, right? Wow, wow. And of course, I know there was a lot of conversation about what's going to happen with trees along um, that stretch especially in the Merrill West area. What's right. Going on well, there's there? been a couple different things. There were some trees that were removed in the Merrill West area or just prior to the Merrill, just south of the Merrill West area that really didn't have anything to do with the project. But uh, there were some residents that came forward. There were mature trees that were very sensitive to trees. It takes a long time for, you know, a tree that's been there 30, 40, 50 years. It's just a shame to cut it down if we can avoid doing that. And actually, um, staff took uh, the public commentary into consideration and modified the plans to retain as much of the trees in question, very mature trees, beautiful trees, as you know, on PV Drive East, uh, and modified the plan to, number one, not, not uh, um, uh, create safety issues, but uh, you know, take safety as number one again, and also the, the veracity of the project, but also keeping the trees in mind, and I think they did a good job in doing that. Excellent. So, yeah. Well, since we're talking trees, one of the issues that came up with, for the council to consider and take a look at is the city's tree maintenance policy. And I have to say, while I was watching the council meeting when they said they actually knew the pretty much official count of trees that the city is in charge of, I think they said 9,400 trees in the city's, you know, public right of ways. That's that, right. City-owned trees. That's amazing. I it, never, it really is. And, uh, you know, there are... That's those, a good trivial pursuit question when you're at a party. How now many we're gonna, trees? 9,400. We're going to have... We'll, we'll call Nicole Jules and ask her the exact <laughs> number because as soon as you plant one, that number changes, right? Right, right. But, uh, yeah, we did talk about the tree maintenance policy and there are times, you know, there's... Uh, 
uh, over the course of the years, there's been different policies, and, and you know, the city uh, has worked through staff with residents, you know, about adopting trees in the median in front of you, and if you cut it, you need to replace it. There's a lot of different moving parts of that, and we've had a couple different departments, community development and public works involved, and uh, the council was, was and, and there's cost associated with it on the part of the residents for applying for a review, and is it interfering with your primary reviewing area and what have you, but, um, we, we, we're trying to streamline that process from, from a cost perspective to someone who would like the, the view impairment looked at that may be caused by a city tree. And number two, maybe just consolidating the entire effort within the Public Works Department. So we asked staff to go back, analyze the process, streamline it, and come back with recommendations. So to make it easier for, for the public to bring forward any concerns they have about city trees. Right. Do you hear from the residents they talk about this with you? Oh, this absolutely issue? they yeah. do. Yeah, it's a, it's a big issue and you got to remember we're 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 a fairly mature city now. We're what 41 years old. We just had our 40th anniversary last year and uh, um, you know, a lot of trees have grown over that time and there's they, there's a a fairly uh, vocal group of residents who who have contacted me early on even while I was campaigning and talking about you need to look at the trees not not just view restoration type trees neighbor to neighbor, but the city's trees that are now encroaching on the public's right. view and the public right of way, and they're, they're right. You know, those things, we need to look at that stuff. All right. And one thing that kind of came up too is that like staff, when they're looking at tree disputes or whatever, they'll come out and like look at your trees, right? And, That's right. And kind of give you an idea of where, where you stand without having to like go through the permit process. Well, we're talking about city trees now, yeah, right? City trees, That's, yeah. Okay. City, not not, not, trees. not yeah. neighbor to neighbor. Yeah, yeah, That's no. true. And that is part of the process, yeah. but there is, there is a significant cost associated with that. And again, we don't need to get specifics, but it's, it's, we're working to streamline that and, and right. not make it cost prohibitive for someone who has a legitimate complaint. Right, right. <clears throat> okay, well, um, we're going to continue talking Mother Nature. We're going to talk about, about the preserve uh -huh. um, because uh, that came up. Um, the issue ongoing always to discuss how we protect our beautiful preserve we have in Rancho Palos Verdes, which is just amazing. Mm -hmm. um, you have always issues there with just keeping those trails perfectly groomed and put together. And I guess um, there's been some concerns uh, by residents and people. So talk about what Well, there's a lot of concerns. You talk about, you know, Rancho Palos Verdes has become a destination area. We talked about it earlier with Abalone Cove and, and you know, Sacred Cove and the Two Points and just our coast in general with Terranea and Trump and, and the preserve. And uh, we, we have a lot of visitors. We are a destination city now. And um, there is a concern the volume, not only at the beaches, but in the preserve has increased dramatically uh, in the various different communities, the hiking community, the biking community, and equestrians to a certain extent at this point. But there's a concern about vandalism um, and, uh, and, and enforcement issues and, and what they call spur trails. I know we talked about that before, which is somebody creating, you know, we have a trail system, but, but there are those that would be inclined to create their own trail. And, you know, they, for whatever reason, they think it's a shortcut or they want to jump with a bike or they want to do whatever mm -hmm. it might be. Um, and, and we have to be very sensitive to that because we have, we have uh, uh, habitat that we have to protect and there's a lot of restoration efforts that, that sometimes um, uh, get, get pushed backwards because of people infringing and, and creating their own little pay, playground and, and not respecting what's going on there. So there was a debate uh, at the very highest levels of the Land Conservancy and those that are very involved and we have a very, again, involved uh, group of residents with respect to trails that are very knowledgeable and I'm very appreciative of all their efforts and their feedback. It's, it's just outstanding and there's a very serious concern for for habitat preservation and safety issues. So the debate is how do you go about policing the preserve? Policing being the, the operative word. And, and there was a dialogue about that and, and the things that came up, number one, and what was the, the prominent theme was education uh, and engagement with the public. We have a volunteer group now that's, that's been trained and is up to speed and they're out in the preserve uh, assisting with enforcement and they, they, don't, they don't have any legal authority but they educate people and report anything that needs to be reported for tracking purposes too mm -hmm. so we can actually see what's going on. And there's we have the, the rangers that are out there from an education perspective and engagement with the public. Um, but then there's another group and, and I'm very sensitive to them too that talks about you know, we, we educate and, and engage, but we're, 
We're probably a little less uh, stringent and dynamic when it comes to enforcement and issuing tickets and telling people, you know, you do, you, you create a spur trailer, you go off the trail here, that, that's a $100 fine and issuing that ticket. So there is a little bit of debate. There are some that argue that we should actually, uh, on an ad hoc basis and on an unannounced basis, have a sheriff's presence uh, in the preserve, which we do on occasion now, but maybe formalize that through the contract um, and, and have what that we have the sheriff's posse, which is on horseback, which we're talking about mm -hmm. bringing to the preserve, which would be outstanding. But <coughs> that debate is ongoing, and I think it's going to be um, it's going to be an evolving process. And I think there is a combination. I think the you know the three E's: education, engagement, and enforcement are are various components. And you know, again, some would argue put a sheriff in there, and someone understands if you violate the law and you see a sheriff, you're going to get you're going to get fined or ticketed. Right. So. Well, I know when you discussed it with the council, there was, you know, the Rangers contract was being approved. And that's right. That's how it all started. In, in terms of, you know, nobody was questioning these Rangers are very good at what they do. But again, focus more on education than issuing the tickets. And, and they can't be everywhere, too. Exactly. So, you know. So. Um, there's a Ranger hotline. To go on, you can go on the city's website and get That's right. Ranger get hotline. that. And there's also uh, the ability to report incidents for tracking purposes and, mm -hmm. and follow up. But. Uh, this will, this will be an ongoing thing and we'll work with the Conservancy to, um, to really uh, balance enforcement and education. And, and again, I understand it all. Well, but it's the, such a jewel of our community, we have to take care of it. And I think, well, I think the residents here get that. And again, it's, it's not to besmirch anyone who doesn't live in RPV or the peninsula in general, but there are people that come in here maybe for a weekend and stuff and may not have that same level of respect as those that worked years to build this and put their heart and soul and go pick up trash and and you know do preserve do uh, habitat restoration work and all these different things there's a there is a there is a a spree decor among you know the peninsula people here that understand what we have and right. some of those that visit may not get that and, when, uh, yeah, and the presentation that was made at the council meeting I mean, you saw you could visually see where like a spur trail how it started to create and what it's Absolutely. doing to the habitat and, uh, and destroying and some, it destroying it and there are situations where that habitat may not come back you know you can see situations and i know some personally where you know a spur trail happens and these things get compacted and you have uh, uh, you know, some, some endangered habitat that's not going to come back. Right. So. But the ranger <coughs> contract was approved, and also you approved the sheriff's contract as well, right? We did. The sheriff's contract at $4.2 million is the largest contract, individual contract uh, um, that we have in the city. And, and again, the sheriffs do a great job. Um, and, and we're happy to, uh, you know, contract with them to provide their services. So. Okay. Next, uh, one items the items came up on your agenda for the council to look at was the procedures um, in in the city for uh, when residents are going to replace a private wall or fence. <clears throat> That's an important issue. Talk about that. It, it is an, a very important issue, and and we're talking specifically on arterials, and that's something that's been. Um, a topic of discussion for years and it's it's a difficult problem because most of the fencing you think about Hawthorne Boulevard Western not so much PV Drive West and South but uh, Hawthorne in particular Western uh, Crenshaw to a certain extent but you know you see chain link fences you see mixed mixed uh, and match type fencing and what what this particular issue did here is and in order to try and preserve some continuity, for example, if somebody has a, a parcel of property that, that borders an arterial, they, we require them to use, um, let's just say the wall fell, for example, you had a pink cinder block wall as an example, and that's old product, but it's, a, it's an easy one to visualize. Um, we don't want someone coming back and putting a wood fence in there or a chain link or a gray cinder block with what we're asking them to do with the approval of the Community Development Department is replace it with similarly uh, uh, situated products so there's some continuity mm -hmm. there because no, nothing worse than a you know a, a just a mishmash of right. different types of fence it doesn't look good. So, it becomes an also, eyesore. It becomes an eyesore and some some people uh, are better than others in what they do and the type of uh, product that they use but we're looking at the whole arterial uh, fence issue. You know, we have chain link fences that block nothing on Hawthorne Boulevard, but those are privately owned. And what we've talked about is maybe working with the, uh, the residents of those in, in those areas where we can take those away. Uh, maybe the city would do it just to, to, to 
just go drive down Hawthorne, you'll see yeah. what I'm talking about. You have a fence on a property up there and a rusted chain link fence that's falling down on Hawthorne. It doesn't need to be there. So we're working on that and, and mm -hmm. staff's doing a pretty good job on trying to get I have to admit, I the... tend to keep looking at Catalina so I can look <coughs> more closely. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that tends to grab my attention, but no, I will look. I haven't noticed that. Yeah. But I've noticed more trees popping up. But... And that's one of the solutions. And I know the uh, the Monaco neighborhood did a great job. There was some chain link fencing and some, some uh, mismatch type fencing. And what they decided to do was plant in front of that and that's one of the potential solutions to this is planting beautification, that way. beautification and, and get some irrigation in there and some drought tolerant plants mm -hmm. so. we could do a whole program on beautification in the city you know mm. a lot of people want to see more of that they do and we, we've heard that refrain for a long time so yeah so I think we covered that one and mm -hmm. um, big big excitement whenever uh, I think the council is always pro let's get the community involved let's get the community involved in any way right. we can and um, you have started a new committee, Infrastructure Management Committee, is that right? We have, actually, yeah. We, that was something that uh, I brought forward a long time ago. Um, and uh, it was, again, mentioned through uh, Chair Leone on the Planning Commission and several others thought that we need a citizen committee to assist the council in making decisions and analyzing. So we, we've approved and created the Infrastructure Management Advisory Committee, affectionately known now as the IMAC. We have the FAC, and now we have the IMAC. I like that. Yeah, and uh, you know they're going to get involved. It's a seven-member committee, and they're going to get involved in everything uh, dealing with infrastructure from our public buildings, parks, trails, uh, storm drains we were talking about earlier, sewers, sewers at Abalone Cove. Um, traffic devices, streets, and the Portuguese Bend landslide. Those are kind of encompasses our whole infrastructure, um, you know, battery of infrastructure that we have to deal with. So the recruitment is actually going on right now as we speak. Uh, applications can be submitted through August 15th. So you've got another, you know, three weeks or so, three and a half weeks. And I would encourage anyone who has any interest in this whatsoever to apply. This is a very, very important committee as far as I'm concerned because there is there is we, we we really desire citizen input and the committees are the one way we get that and they they analyze it they focus on it and they come up with recommendations we have our, our citizen committees are just outstanding we have incredible talent to pick from and I know probably people think well should I be an engineer if I want to apply really any professional background is obviously I agree and and you know engineers are uh, welcome to apply and anybody who has an interest in any of this mm -hmm. and 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 learning and educating and being part of, part of a decision making body and advisory body for the council and I'm I just can't wait to see what what everybody yeah. comes up well, with good. you know so, so it's exciting and congratulations people to people go on the city website to get information about being able to apply for that that's right I think it's under the city clerks section there but it's uh, it's an important committee and we're looking forward to the feedback we're talking about in infrastructure management plan in the future and we want their feedback on that and this committee is going to have to work in conjunction with the FAC because once once this committee talks about the actual infrastructure product projects how are we going to pay for it so there's the you know deciding on what to do and how you're going to pay for components so there's going to be some interplay there all right um, we have to wrap it up we're at the almost end of our hour and we're going to end on a fun note because uh, the month of July was uh, Parks and Recreation Month and uh, we are so proud of what we have here for our Rec and Parks Department here. So much is offered to the community. A lot of fun. And, of course, always kicking off July with the 4th of July. I was back in Boston. And so we you, missed were, you, you were there. Yeah, I, it was, I could have it thrown was, a pie at yours. Do they do you, that still? You could have. There, was, the there was a pie eating. And, uh, I missed that. <coughs> they didn't throw a pie at the mayor, but I'm sure several <laughs> people wanted to. But uh, the, uh, there was a young, young man, uh, probably in his mid to 20s or 30s, but he just destroyed the competition with respect to the pie eating. It was something to see. So but it, it was a good. It was a good day. Great day. Record crowds. Uh, very well run. Um, you know, staff staff has that down to a science now. And we have uh, you know new director of Rec and Parks, Corey Linder, who was on site, and Dan and the whole crew, and Mona. You know, congratulations on them. Another well run event, and just lots and lots of people. My family was there, friends, and it was it was terrific. Right. And they had the helicopter rides or no? Yes, they, they did. did. And I actually took a nice ride again and looked around and flew over San Ramon and Fabulous. flew over your house. It yeah. was good. <laughs> well, you didn't come to Boston, but that's okay. No, but and your house, though. Here <laughs> <on our TV. laughs> Thank you for checking in on us. Yeah. Um, okay. And also, I know by the time this runs, it will already pass, but the Rec and Parks Department, again, trying to offer the community a lot. Like mm -hmm. this weekend coming up, they're going to have... Uh, the first volunteer day. They're going to try to start 
a wave of getting more volunteers, and right. they're going to be down at Lower Hess Park cleaning up. Correct. That's and this they have Saturday, a, a exactly. Movie in the park and all kinds of great things. Yeah, they have uh, ET is going to be shown at Eastview Park on the east side of the hill uh, early in the evening. There's some festivities, I believe, starting at seven, yeah. sponsored by the YMCA, and the movie's going to start at eight o'clock, and that's on the uh, 26th. And then following that, on the 27th, we have uh, Shakespeare by the Sea, uh, Midsummer's Night Dream. Yeah. That has I part. like that one. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good old. And they say, bring your picnic blanket and uh, or your, your so on that note, basket. Should we end on to be or not to be? That is the question. This show is no longer going to be. We have to say goodbye. That <laughs> sounds good. That sounds good. Always wonderful to have you here, Meredith Hovind. Well, Hoven. thank you. We'll see you next month. Absolutely. And, um, again, thanks for joining us here on RPV City Talk with Mayor Jerry Dehovic. I'm Liz Brown Swanson. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for watching.